Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Proverbs, the 25th chapter. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence, or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. What your eyes have seen, do not hastily bring into court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself, and do not reveal another's secret, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you, and your ill repute have no end. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his masters. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the fourth chapter. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? 
but they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us in the conscious Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus told this parable. When you are invited to the wedding feast, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Lord tells this parable to the Pharisees in order to remind them and us to beware the sin of pride and self-righteousness. Remember, the Pharisees are the ultimate self-righteous religious people. Not that being religious is bad. On the contrary, we should take our faith and the living out of our Christian religion very seriously. To be religious means to follow and adhere to something with strong commitment and zeal. And when it comes to God's word and the hearing of God's word, we should be very religious. In fact, this is the proper way to keep the Sabbath. Remember the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred, gladly hear and learn it. That's what the Pharisees weren't understanding about the Sabbath. Many people take too legalistic a view of the Sabbath day, that you're keeping the Sabbath as long as you don't do any work. No, that's not the main point. 
Jesus corrects that when he says, who of you wouldn't rescue an ox or a donkey if they fell into a well or their child? You see, we rest in the Lord when we rest in his word. But we need to be careful that our zeal and religiosity does not let us to think too highly of ourselves so that we begin to look down on others. Unfortunately, this was also a problem for the disciples as well. How many times did they want to know who would sit at the Lord's right hand and filled with jealousy and pride asked, who will be greatest in Jesus' kingdom? Too many. You see, the Pharisees wanted Jesus to be thrilled because they had made time for him. In their pride, they expected him to make a fuss over them because of their good works. Sometimes the old Pharisee and us can do the same thing. We think we deserve special attention from Jesus, or even extra kudos because we take time out of our busy schedules to come to church. We expect God to make a fuss over us because we already held our tempers didn't cuss out that driver that cut us off in traffic, or that clerk at the grocery store who didn't give us correct change, or that waitress who spilled the wine on us in the restaurant. We're tempted to think that because we do so much for the Lord, when we do come to church, that we deserve special treatment, or that we are better than those other sinners who don't sacrifice as much time and money as we think we do. And that's precisely why the Lord must correct us, holding the law before our faces, bring us to humility, so that trusting in Him for our salvation rather than to ourselves and our good works, we approach His table, His altar, and our seat in His church with humility. Just like the old Pharisee in us, those Pharisees then, and yes, the disciples too, they always expected Jesus to tell them how good they were. We expect this. We think very highly of ourselves. We don't think we're bad like that sinner who murdered Pastor Alan Henderson a couple weeks ago. We don't think we're bad like those people who commit abortions or go get abortions. Or those bigots. Or those racists. And yet too often what are our hearts filled with? arrogance and pride, not humility. And we too, like those Pharisees, don't expect the Lord to correct us. In their ignorant pride, they were going to tell Jesus how things should be. And so do we. We don't like it when things don't go the way we want in our life, and often what is our first response? To get angry with God. We forget that we're the problem. You see, when Jesus doesn't play the game our way, tickling our ears, affirming our arrogant behavior, then we can become like those self-righteous Pharisees, wanting to catch Jesus in some loophole of the wall, or the law. You see, they didn't understand their own need for mercy and healing. So they wanted to scold God's son for being a false teacher and showing mercy and healing someone on the Sabbath. And yet, dear Christians, this is exactly what Jesus still does. Yes, we can try to twist God's word to suit our own desires rather than humble ourselves to his word and teaching. This happens every time we listen to our own hearts rather than the word of God. And that's breaking the first commandment. Remember, you shall have no other gods before you. This means we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And sadly, too many things become our God and idol in this life. And they must be cast down. And that's why in humility we come here. So rather than trusting in human reason or the delights of the flesh, we take comfort in Christ and what he teaches us through the scriptures. See, hear the words of the Apostle Paul. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Paul calls himself a prisoner of the Lord. Can he be translated servant or slave? And he was. Imprisoned for preaching Christ. Imprisoned for proclaiming the good news that is an offense to those who are hardened, smug, self-righteous people. But he also preached a word that melts the heart, brings faith, life, and salvation to those who have ears to hear and for whom the law has brought them low. You see... 
Christ came for sinners. Jesus came to seek into the lost and to bring despair to those who would reject him, trusting in their own goodness and bringing joy to those who would see the salvation that was won for them by Christ and receive it with thanksgiving. Because we are to give thanks and praise to the one who has healed us of the horrible disease of sin on the Sabbath, and that brings us from death to life, so that for all eternity, we have the promise of being with our Lord. Because Paul, you, me, and all believers in Christ are all, in a sense, prisoners of the Lord, bound by the word. Perhaps not bound in chains in a Roman dungeon or locked up in a cell or a cage awaiting persecution and death, but again, we are held captive by the word which grabs us, sets us apart. Chosen by God, we have been separated from the world and its ways, and we are not to live for ourselves any longer. But we're to live for Jesus. And that means obeying his commands to love God with all of our heart and soul and our neighbors as ourselves. And yet, sadly, our weak flesh can't do that. At least not on its own. We need the Holy Spirit to fill us with the word so that, yes, we do love the law of God and desire to keep it. And therefore, we must remember as prisoners for the Lord ourselves, Paul tells us that with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And we do this in humility for all the Lord has done for us, not trying to avoid his words, not bearing grudges for the healing, forgiveness, life, salvation, and good things he chooses to give to those around us, but rejoicing in his mercy for all and for all that he does, and then thanking him for his mercy for us as well. And we rejoice in this because bound to the word, we have the words of eternal life. And we have the teaching that focuses on Christ and Him crucified. The teaching that reminds us there is one faith and one baptism. So not in the chains of the law any longer, but set free from the law to live as Christ's holy people. We praise Him for His sacrifice for us and for our salvation, which has released us from death and the power of the devil himself. And this blessed reality gives us joy as well. And just as St. Paul wrote, there is one body, one spirit, just as you are called into the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And humbly sitting before the throne of God, before this altar, pulpit and font, your Lord has promised to lift you up from death to eternal life because he has chosen to dwell with you through his word, give you his spirit so that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so remember as well the word of the Lord from wise King Solomon. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. And knowing our own sin and too often lack of humility and love for others, we don't come here demanding a place at the head of his table. Instead, we take comfort in these words of our Lord, friend, move up higher. And baptized into Christ, the Lord has reached out from heaven to pour out forgiveness on you, his own dear brothers and sisters in his name. He has healed you eternally with the greatest miracle you can receive this side of his return in glory. He has forgiven you your sins and in doing so has bound you to himself by placing his name upon you, claimed you as his own and exchanged your death for his life in the waters that pulled you from the very depths of hell and lifted you up to give you a place with himself in heaven. <clears throat> He chose to do this not because of some great achievement of your own doing, but rather because in your weak flesh you were dead in your trespasses along with the rest of humanity and unable to save yourselves. And in doing so, 
as your Lord was high and lifted up on the cross, he has given you a place of honor that is his to give to whoever he chooses, and your Lord chooses to have you come and sit with him here and dine at his table. And that reality is here for us at this feast this morning. What we're doing this morning is not preparing a meal to impress him or to offer him, but rather that he prepares and invites us to a meal of his own word and his own body and blood and the bread and wine of his supper. And certainly the day will come when this short life is ended and our Lord will lift us up from this veil of tears and from the very grave itself. The day will come when he calls to us, calls us to himself in heaven and calls us out of this valley of the shower of a shadow of death. But the great joy for us on this Lord's day is that he works forgiveness and salvation for you here now. You don't have to wait until we die and go to heaven to dine with the Lord. He comes to us because we need him here this day and always as we struggle daily against sin, death, and the power of the devil, those alluring temptations to be smug and skeptical. As Jesus warned those Pharisees then, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Therefore, do not come to the Lord's table if you do not believe his words. After all, what is the Holy Supper, this heavenly banquet to which our Lord invites us? We believe the sacrament of the altar is his true body and blood, given under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and to drink. And who comes to this meal worthily? You who believe his words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Because these words, along with the bodily eating and drinking, are the main thing in the sacrament. For where you have the forgiveness of sins, there you must also have eternal life and salvation. And don't come to the Lord's table with unrepentant hearts either, thinking that you don't need the Lord's mercy. You see, that's the sin of the self-righteous, the Pharisee that lurks in us. For this meal is for sinners. That is, for those repentant saints who desire the Lord's forgiveness. Because this is what humble faith does. It recognizes that we deserve nothing from the Lord, and yet, despite our sin, rejoices that he forgives us and gives us something that we do not deserve in this holy supper, his own body and blood, so that we can be certain of the Lord's love for us. The Sabbath meal to which you have been called to by the Lord is provided at his feast, at this altar. It's where he invites you to kneel with the other forgiven, restored, thankful, believing saints and to receive you or to give you what you need for your eternal good. And think about this as well. Not just with those who kneel <coughs> beside you at this table this morning, but as we marvel to ponder with angels and archangels and all the host of heaven. Because in this meal to which you have been invited, it is for all the saints. That is, for all those who have been declared righteous by God himself, not boasting in their own merits, worthiness, or good works, but boasting in their Savior and all that he has done to bring peace with God through his own innocent suffering and the precious blood that he shed. Because what happens here is for those who humbly hear and trust his words. For the Lord gives you a meal that is more miraculous than any healing in the Bible. Because what the Lord gives you this day is for you personally. It is yours from him. It is his body and his blood and the wine which gives you the feast that we rejoice in this day. Not arrogantly demanding it as if our right because we've earned it. But with humble joy we've been lifted up and exalted by our Lord. As he reaches out to you and you hold out your hands to him to receive his body and the bread and taste on your lips his blood that is for our eternal good. Because again, your Lord has raised you to the highest place you can be this side of heaven. And he has exalted you in the forgiveness and meal that he offers to the humble of heart. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. service at Holy Cross Lutheran Church, Carlisle, Iowa. Join us this coming Sunday at the Divine Service, which begins at 9 a.m. Our Divine Service is followed by Adult Bible Study and Sunday School at 10.30. You're also invited to join us for Vespers and Catechesis for the entire family on Wednesday evenings beginning at 6.30 p.m. We also gather for the morning prayer service of Matins on Thursday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Holy Cross is a member of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and is located at 1100 Market Street, Carlisle, Iowa.